Hey guys, yeah, it's been a while, I always say that. Anyway, uh, I've finished uni and now I'm getting on with my life, basically. Um, so yeah, this is Gaming the Game. What does that even mean? Well, probably I've put a more extensive title on the the front of the video, so um, you probably already know. But anyway, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a long one. I went to B-Sides and I've also finished university, so... It's going to be a little bit easier. I've got some interesting things coming up. Uh, hopefully I'll just release a lot more research than, than beforehand. But I, I mean, I can't promise anything. If I promise something and it doesn't deliver, then I'm sorry. But I, I just can't promise, can I? So let's just put that together. Anyway, gaming the game. So basically, first of all, it's pretty interesting how in 2012, um, someone that had general knowledge made 60 grand a year. Now, I'm not really fully sure if that's correct. Like, that that seems like too much for 10,000 pubs earning £60 an hour. Now, I don't know, uh, but I did find it rather interesting when it came down to my research that someone could possibly get 60 grand a year. Maybe they don't, but still, that you could possibly get money from that. So, um, I'm, I haven't really introduced it, and I got that, okay. Um, didn't really do these slides very well. Essentially, um, I looked at pub quiz machines. Uh, so, you know, I go to a pub with friends and I see this pub quiz machine and we start going on it and it's interesting because there's been a few times where we've been on it and I've suddenly realised what operating system it is and I've suddenly realised that there's a actual possibility of me being able to have a little look at this in an interesting manner. So I decided, why not? Let's go see what this pub quiz machine is all about in, in to some degree. Because uh, it's always interesting to do exotic things like this. Uh, I'm not going to say what vendor though. That's that's why there's not saying what vendor is. Um, it's because I think it's, it's not that hard if I do. Um, and it's not my intention to do that. It's actually just exploring and research really. I'm not trying to bring anything bad to them. It is simply just education and research that I'm simply doing this for. So that's that's why I'm not releasing what where it was what what it is basically. Why do I why did I do it? Um understand how criminals could game the system. There's plenty of ways in which you could potentially earn money from doing a, not that much to be honest. Um to earn money. So a little bit different from obviously this guy but still you know, you know, being able to basically know what's going to happen or in some manner. Uh, it's a technical challenge. It's different from what anyone else has ever done, probably. Um, and so I thought, why not? Let's just have a look. How safe are pub machines from manipulation? A bit different, but there are circumstances where this does send home. And so there's, I mean, I don't show a lot of that in this, this presentation because... I've got other things in here, but there is some interesting things about how pub machines could be changed in some way and how there may be issues in future security considerations when it comes down to a cashless sort of system where it's simply cards. Um, at the moment, obviously, these only accept coins. Um, they're pub machines, um, but it is something to note. I get to notice how bad games are when I'm not in the pub as well. Um, did notice that. A uh, bit worried for me, to be honest. Uh, I was like, this is not This is a really poor game, actually. Um, so yeah, re really interesting to do this sort of thing. This came in correlation with my actual uni work and other work that I was doing, so it isn't like I've just been, you know, giving you guys a long big break for a couple of months. There are, like, I had a huge amount of work, loads of things going on, and so it it's basically important, unless he wanted me to sort of um, just do a, a video every week of me sitting here going, all right, I'm pretty busy, <laughs> um, then it, it wouldn't have been possible. Um, so first things first, that is the actual real darkened, really, um, picture of the machine. Essentially, I'm just showing you a screen. You can see two buttons. Um, but it's essentially just showing you a screen that I blurrily got because it was actually turned on and off without me knowing. And then I saw this and I got a little bit excited and um, luckily got a picture of Windows 2000's login screen or, or setting up screen rather. Um, 
And that's a ridiculously old operating system. I've hit something down the bottom there. Let's just move that. Uh, it's a ridiculously old system for what it actually is. And this is dependent on the configuration, connected to the internet in some manner. Um, so it is it is something to shout about, certainly. Um, now, the generation for random numbers, not great for secure transfer. There was some, in my... Um, reverse engineering sort of look at what it was the analysis that's the word i'm looking for um it was peculiar um it did look like ftp scp that sort of thing retrieving file lists and something but i don't know what protocol it was and obviously i can run it to a degree or you'll see in a moment where i was able to verify much of that there was open ssl um, library involved and other, but the, the main thing is is that random number generation for Windows 2000 is not ideal. It's not the best. Now we look at the paper, and the research does talk about how obviously um, remote is a little bit less applicable. Um, I believe, if I'm remembering the right paper that I've read, hopefully it's um, attacks within the system um, with an executable. Um, within the system, but it's still uh, fairly applicable to this because random number generation in Windows 2000, I can guarantee, is much, much worse than what we have currently. Or even in sort of, you know, Vista, uh, there's a lot of security aspects to Windows 2000 that are very different to modern computing overall. And although we talk about embedded systems with XP, um, Obviously, that's a horrific thing that needs to change, especially in the, the wake of the WannaCry events. I had to put it in, guys. I had to put it in. Um, so there's there's lots of problems with having old operating systems, essentially, is what I've put here in a really slow way. But that is a real picture. Um, you can see there, that's actually where you put the money. This is a real picture that's been intentionally darkened. The, <laughs> I was in a pub, to be fair. Um to show the actual machine itself in what the operating system was. A lot of the visual aspects to this will be blurred or darkened when it comes down to um, actual giveaways of what it is. Uh, so stuff like this I can easily say, oh, well, that's that I don't need to um, censor in some way. So what's interesting is that updates were available online. So I could simply download these updates. Now these updates weren't full system updates and you would think with firmware or what they called updates, you would have sort of an ISO or some Linux operating or even just some sort of um, security in some manner of it actually being unable to analyze it without first having some security feature. Now, there's a lot of security f security features to this machine. I must say they have implemented some, um, but they do allow you to update from downloading, essentially, with no authentication, which is interesting. There is also multiple ways that this can up be updated. Um, essentially, the games can be updated in certain ways uh, where they remotely get... Um, the the packages or you can download them and put the packages on yourself so there's 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 multiple ways of doing it and as well as that there is evidence that the machine sends a lot of information to this hub in which you can remotely a bit like the cpw oh no I don't, the tr69 protocol where you, you're the the router sends diagnostics and is able to be updated remotely because that's the in thing to do a bit like that where statistics and other things are sent to it there are evidence of that so that's a little bit worrying when it comes down to the operating system and what it is but there's interesting aspects to this machine as well um the installer drops so w w once we've got this update it's not a ISO, as I say, it's as dot .zip, right? It's got a bunch of binaries in it, and it's got one executable binary that I don't need to say executable binary. There is one executable, um, which is always there, which is basically the updater. You click it, and it will update it, right? So, um, with that, once the installer is actually run, it aggressively changes the resolution, um, presumably to help the operator that's updating it because screens will be different, I'm presuming, from different machines, because um, this is global. Um, and it drops in, in 
install.txt into the temp. Now, the install.txt is within the actual package itself, in the zip file that we've probably extracted at this point. And essentially, it's all encrypted. It's just nonsense. I have no idea what's going on with it when I first saw it. I was like, well, this, this is a good start. I thought I had something interesting. Well, if you just run exe from the, the installer exe, then you... um. You'll be able to do it without the algorithm or the key um, whatsoever and be easily given this interesting batch file essentially, which it, well, heavily modified batch file, which is essentially giving instructions in a certain manner to extract the archives and be it, they've all got random passwords as well. I should say that as well. I've given a little highlight here. We can briefly see dash p and then g. Maybe you can CDL, but they're randomized passwords, which was interesting because when I was first initially doing this research, I saw from older machines statically set passwords. And I was like, right, now, now I can try it on this. It didn't work. So I was a little bit upset, so I had to delve a little bit further. They are using 7-zip to extract the archives, and they do distribute that binary as well. I didn't really have to put the left picture there saying opening subroutine and decrypting subroutine, but actually I didn't delve into a vast amount, um, so I felt like I should give it there. Um, a little bit more on the decryption as well. Um, so I I went a little bit further, even though you know you could decrypt, I, I found it a little bit interesting and actually I didn't actually recognize what it was doing first of all. I was a little bit confused and perplexed really um, and I couldn't really find well, I, did, I, I didn't have to bother finding the algorithm or key that it was doing, right? But I, I looked, and it opens the installer file and then treats the data within it. So this is the opening of um, the installer file, the very start. And what we can see here, actually, that might be scrolled up. There was, I think there was header files. I'm, I'm not being, No, there wasn't. No, there wasn't. I'm good. Um, that was something else. Um, and essentially it threw me a little bit because if you can see these are actually in reverse. Ah, so, oh, keep moving it. If we can see the 0F there is 78 and that's actually at the start of MM4 of the quad words. And obviously endianness had something to do with this. It's just I was a little bit unsure what was going on to be honest at first. So it, it took me a while to notice this. It's an interesting function because it doesn't use anything but as it says there, hard-coded values, the actual function that decrypts the initial quad words. So it puts two quad words together, jumbles it a little bit, changes and manipulates these quad words, and then exclusive ors, and then returns it, and we get a sort of, well, a plain text version, essentially. But there's no... Um, no real evidence of a solid key on, on what I could see. It's, it's these two exclusive oring each other from what I could see initially. I don't want to put so much confidence into that, but it's interesting because because of these hard-coded values, essentially I think if you it, it's, you gave two arguments, which is these two values that you extracted from the installer file, and you could have you could essentially strip this because it's straight out assembly, straight out assembly, and it could be used for config extra extraction if you were, you know, doing something interesting with this. So it's um it was certainly something interesting. Um what what led me to think that it wasn't actually conventional encryption is this. So the decryption header was always going to be GWENC. And it hints to me that this is homebrew encryption of some sort. And I'm saying hints because I don't want to say no to conventional encryption because it would be a really dumb idea for them, but I couldn't identify it myself. The value is used to check for later whether the actual decryption is uh, has worked, essentially. So invalid encryption file found is what happens if it doesn't get that header. And that isn't a checksum whatsoever. That is simply uh, GWENC. So it's relying on the algorithm in some manner to verify that the encryption worked. Um, which is interesting, but this is actually the resolution that it's trying to set. So it goes for GWENC and then some. I, I'm not sure about these eight zero eight DC here, and then we move to this, which is basically the settings being set. So resolution, which are put as install.txt into the temporary directory. So we've gone a bit full circle there. I've already talked about this, 
but there are hints of old as shit operating, system, operating systems used. The highest in this is Windows XP. That's all I need to discuss, really. Um, it did worry me. I'm going to lift my face here. That's Microsoft Windows 98. Um, so they're not really fans of updating the machines. I don't know if that's down to licensing or just they straight out are too comfortable in that environment. Um, but that is a very, very old system nowadays. And some of the, as I say, some of these are connected to the internet. So it is a interesting fact that they've decided on leaving them. And they have been updated regularly. Um, I think the last update was December 2016 from what I can last remember. Who knows? Um, but it's certainly nothing old in the fact of them developing. They're actively developing. Interesting crypto. Yeah, there was a number of um, a number of elements of cryptography here. Um, to here, there's indicators of homebrew cryptography. Um, hashing is mixed. They use MD5 in some ways, and then they use SHA-256 for the file integrity. Um, now, MD5 is used in some manner for, um, I think for the packages that actually come in in other ways, from what I can remember. Um, there are actually also statically set MD5 strings that are truncated. Now, the issue with truncation with MD5 is evidently MD5 collisions, and these are sometimes used in integrity checks and making sure that encrypted files are correct, and so there's issues there. Um, so yeah, don't truncate MD5, essentially. I think there was actually uh, SHA-1 as well. Someone truncated SHA-1. I think Google did some research. Oh, they did SHA-1 collisions, but also there was, um, I think it, oh, it was Kaspersky or someone, where they, were, they had um, certificates that were being validated by truncated SHA-1, and obviously if you collide a certain number, then they're going to have two certificates that are going to be the same, which makes one of them invalid and one of them essentially valid. Um, I think that was an interesting time for research for Google. Um, and I think that was the full story. You can possibly get that from Google. You can get that from Project Zero. Um, I'm trying to remember the full story and it's not fully working. But anyway, um, most of the binaries from the authors were developed in Delphi. The, the, PP, the PBB or PDB. Ah, oh, there's so process control. Ah, oh, you know what? I don't even know. The the information about how it was compiled um, was still there. It wasn't stripped um, and allowed you to see the path. But basically, that's not really interesting. That's only interesting in malware, I guess. Um, but it was in Delphi, which I'm really not a fan of. And uh, I, I wish they wouldn't. The C++ that was used was wrappers or installers or, or libraries that were used from other people. Third-party libraries were also used in this, actually, mostly for money collection and APIs, which is weird as like ex getting an understanding from the API if a money's been inserted. I'm guessing from they, they have, um, from the initial physical board, they have some sort of um, interaction with the, the kernel. I don't know if it's modified or, or of somewhat or, or what. The sad thing is that I don't have the full system. I just have an update which has minimal amount of applications and DLLs. And so I sort of have to take some speculation as well. Um, there's also some really interesting references to a lot of different things. So um, web servers. A, a web server is actually locally available on this. And there's also references to backdoors as well. It says server backdoor sometimes, which is an interesting one. Um, custom libraries for simple operations. Uh, they have a, a DLL for like, uh, called a watchdog, which is essentially gets it count wait a certain amount of time to exit this process to go to the menu, back to the menu. So they've left it idle and it exits within like 30 seconds or so. So it's... Um, not not good in the fact that it's it's really simplistic in the way that they have DLLs wrote but it's it's just it's interesting to see but there is communication between a web server that's that's confirmed there's also some um communication with the remote servers in regards to updates that i can see from the binaries themselves but um yeah delphi overall delphi binaries no please no so as I've previously mentioned, um, previously mentioned, uh, we have a watchdog process, which overall 
actually is different from that. I shouldn't have used the word watchdog from the DLL. The DLL is called watchdog, but it's essentially waiting to, for the time to change and see how active the user has been. This watchdog process, which I've renamed to make it a little bit harder to find this, this system, is essentially overseeing everything that's going on. So it has a fraud detection system in some regards. Um, it, it checks registry. It keeps things up to check. Checks the amplifier. This is where it also checks the expiry of the machine, checks the credits of the machine. So it overhauls everything and keeps everything okay. Within that, there is also the local HTTP server, which essentially keeps track of and has a database, I'm pretty sure, of um, keeps track of the scores locally and also, um, I'm guessing, scores the statistics. Uh, gets the stati bleh, statistics. We also have the menu application, which is open most of the time. And obviously, once the menu application also executes games, which pop up beforehand. Um, now, most of this is actually controlled from startup with batch scripts, from what I could personally see. Um, and they do have, as I say, a custom way of doing batch, which is really quite lovely. To be honest, um, I, I quite like seeing some difference, to be honest. It's, it's nice to see different things. A, lo a load of different files that are beneficial, um, but I, I won't be able to see um, because, obviously, I don't have the full machine, which doesn't help me. Um, I can't ask a pub to be like, hey, c excuse me, could I take your hard drive? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, I can't do that, sadly. Um, so I have to take from what I get on these updates and understand it a little bit better in that way. One highlight is um, temp666, which is a strange sort of um, number to choose. Um, and it's the encrypted version of date of expiry. So um, it is decrypted in some way and, um, allow, and it gets environment variables, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Auth dat is also something that's notable, um, which I talk about later on, I believe, as well, which is an encrypted with some form of MD5 used for authentication of some sort. Um, now, I'm thinking, because uh, we actually have credentials for um, broadband or a line of some sort of dial-up, I don't really know, but there is some form of uh, credentials for that. But I think auth.dat is actually to retrieve files from a certain remote server um, that it has. Um, now, I did do a little bit of research into remote, the remote communication between it, uh, but it was a custom... Well, I couldn't recognize what it was sending to me. And at that point, um, you can't do a lot unless you want to do something very illegal. So um, I left it at that and was like, fair enough. Um, Auth.dat looks to be important to the verification of the system is what i saw from this um i i can't fully i'm speculating here because obviously i don't have this the full details um but basically i need i need dynamic analysis to properly verify this with the amount that i i have so um I, I can't really, uh, there, there's files missing, there's certain things. I was quite lucky in the way that games were done because I could actually emulate them in certain ways. But there are too many subroutines and calls to verify correctly at the moment for, from static analysis. And I think there's a lot missing as well. Um, some files are required, as I say. Emulation of files can only go so far. So, um, yeah, um, the watchdog process really helps out. And so I can't really fully speculate on it but it's an interesting thing to see because um the the security of this machine is has some really good incorporations of of um integral security sort of fundamentals like um integrity you know checking hashing things like that ensuring that fraud from looking at what the environment is like but also it has some pitfalls to it as well especially when I have such a limited environment, Windows 2000. Um, machine expiry looks to be an interesting one that you could possibly definitely get rid of. Um, it uses the call get local time, but it doesn't all, all it also looks at um, locale information. And from what I could gather, Delphi registry, um, which is looking like it has the time in some way, I think, 
Um, it looks to go into a really generic area of Delphi, um, which I'm not too um, clued up on. Um, it doesn't seem too extensive either. Um, and I think you could manipulate temp66.dat um, by looking at the decryption of it. There's a lot of printing and logging of things that allow you to, once you see the strings and once you understand the flow um, a little bit easily, um, it, it is quite evident that the, the verification could be potentially patched if you took the hard drive and looked at the system a little bit better. But obviously, I'm doing this for research. I'm not here to completely destroy someone's machine. Um, it's just interesting to look at. Um, and the thing is, if it expires, you can't play any of the games. So, that's not lots of fun, is it? So, I wanted to play some games, basically. That's the whole reason. I was like, look, look I play these, these games in a pub. Why can't I play these games um, at home? So, let's give it a go. Why not? Let's give it a try. Um, so, the DLLs are actually distributed. A lot of them are distributed within the update, so it's much easier than I first thought. I thought I'd have to scour the internet for loads of DLLs that were non-existent and are only available within the machine. The actual ones that aren't available, um, you can emulate in some way um, to make it a little bit easier. Uh, again, it does aggressive change in resolution, and I don't like it. <laughs> um, it's very annoying to once you're debugging, and actually patching and debugging in, in its own sort of dynamic analysis of these binaries of the games themselves it was very p picky and I'm not fully sure um, it didn't look to have vast anti-analysis and I'm not really sure why it got so picky or why it got so um, unhappy about the ch so I patched things and then it wouldn't do it and it wouldn't run whatsoever and it wouldn't and it was um, it was relatively hard to actually finally do um, eventually I thought I'm not dealing with DirectX anymore and resolution issues and trying to find the cursor. So I chose to use a wrapper, which is fantastic, DXWND. And um, yeah, that saved me, basically. Um, so I had to make sure the, the mouse was visible because it, the, the actual pub machine's a touchscreen. And so I don't have a touchscreen. Um, and also uh, I need to be able to click from here. Maybe later on I'll do something else, but at the moment I need to make sure that the mouse is able to click and I can see where the mouse is. Um, most games have um, a generic sort of function that allows you to add money to it. Um, so either someone's given that to be distributed, that code to allow someone to do that, or I don't know what's going on. There's a lot of libraries, that, that DLLs, that allow you to open credits and check credits, but there's also um, what seems to be a generic function in a lot of these games which calls that and does it in a certain way um, and that is where I patched most of the executables at that change where it did the call and then I basically hard-coded um, some values to make sure that the money was forever essentially um, after multiple attempts it finally worked and I have sort of um, censored it quite a lot and the reason for that is because obviously I, I don't want it to be a big thing. I just did this for interesting research, really. Um, not all of the games work yet, that's for sure. Um, a lot of them with 3D graphics don't like me, um, but it is working to some degree. And I'm, I'm highlighting this, it's very hard to see, but that does have a value that isn't no money. Um, so it's, it's really good that that happened and I got it working and I'm quite happy with that. This picture that's heavily censored that everyone has no idea what's going on, essentially that's asking a question and you've got some choices there. Uh, yeah, also, um, so a lot of these games, that when I mean decentralised, I mean they're so, sort of self-containing, so um, it's not that hard to sort of reverse engineer, change the credits, change it in some manner, and then play it. And so it's also interesting because when we think at the start of this, what I was talking about, I was talking about how you could replicate this and know all about the questions and earn money from this. Well, you can repeatedly look at the questions. And actually, the questions are encrypted. Um, and I'm working on that. But it's very easy to keep playing this game. Um, and there's also a win rate, understanding that. You can finally understand the machine overall. So a little bit of technical, because obviously you haven't seen a lot of either here. And the main reason for that is obviously... Um, I did do a lot of reverse engineering, actually. The m most I've done in a, b a sort of system... Um, but a lot of it I feel like would give it away because there's a lot of 
debug strings and identifiers in some manner. Um, so the call goes out to check for money. Essentially, that's what call sub 40E220 is. And then it gets the tick count. Now, it does exit. But what it wanted first does is it wants to check first um, what's going on. Does it exit the application? But it also um, it stores it here. This is the D word that it, the double word that it's, it keeps the money. And what you can do is you can change that EAX, or you could change it here, I believe. Uh, that's just a reference to the D word. But um, essentially, patching is is just changing that from the D word, and then it will return it for you because the EAX value <coughs> by con con uh, convention will be the return value. And um, so that's the main part of where all the, all the money is coming from. So what next? Well, I guess, you know, most people's conclusions would be uh, get the physical machine in reverse engineer. Uh, reverse engineer. But the issue with that is um, that would be lovely, but um, they do cost quite a lot. So um, I don't know if that'll be happening anytime soon. It's been an interesting one, certainly. Um, I've learned quite a lot from it. Also, understanding the mechanics of some machines that are quite old. Um, reverse engineer, more of the system to build a fully fully fledged gaming part of of what it is well some of the games aren't included and also um maybe but it, it isn't a huge priority for me the main priority was understanding the system researching and, and sort of just doing it blindly from having a segmented bits of it and trying to recover pieces to it so um essentially i was able to play a game from the updates online instead of buying the machine which isn't great either um, but actually the reverse engineering aspect of it was technically relatively, not challenging, but relatively interesting. Um, okay, that is all I have for you. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Um, thank you very much for waiting for this and also probably watching this. It's been relatively long now. Um, so thank you very much and I'll see you guys in the next video. See you later.